Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we are going to examine demographic characteristics from the perspective of women. Women's status is closely associated with reproductive behavior, fertility rates, mortality rates, and migration patterns. So let's begin with some of the political, social, and economic features of tonight's lecture, and then we'll discuss their impacts. As women gain greater access to land, money, education, and influence, there are a variety of demographic characteristics that change. Less than 40% of countries provide girls and boys with equal access to education. So let's take a moment. What type of map are we looking at here? What is our scale of analysis? And is school enrollment, looking at the percentage of girls to boys, a good indicator of development? And hopefully you recognize that this is a choropleth map at the national scale of analysis, and that generally, as countries become more developed, we see more females enrolled in school, a positive correlation. When women have fewer educational opportunities, job prospects and political influence can be severely limited. In many developing countries, Women have traditional gender roles, meaning that women are discouraged from working outside the home. They are expected to care for children and elderly members of the family. Educational achievement also has a positive correlation with age of marriage. Typically, as the level of education goes up, women will marry later in life. For example, from 1950 to 2010, the median age of marriage in the United States went from 20 years to 27 years. Education can also refer to knowledge of health care. With increasing knowledge, women learn about family planning, and it can also increase access to regular health care for both mothers and babies. Which leads us into the first major section of our discussion tonight. We'll begin by talking about fertility rates and their relationship to women's status. When we examine our choropleth map of national scale fertility rates, we see that generally fertility rates are higher in developing countries or LDCs and they're lower in developed countries or MDCs. But fertility rates have declined over the last several decades around the world. Several of the factors we discussed on the previous slide contribute to this pattern. Women who are more educated tend to have fewer children. But in many developing countries, particularly those in the Middle East and South Asia, girls still receive less education than boys. And as we mentioned, Education has a positive correlation with age of marriage. The age of marriage can impact fertility rates because when women marry younger, they have more childbearing years ahead of them and fertility rates are often higher. And it's important to note that these statistics can vary by scale as well. India's current total fertility rate is 2.1 babies per woman, but in several states it's higher and in others it's lower. These fertility rates have a strong positive correlation with female literacy rate in each state. Remember to be critical of our information and always wonder, what would happen if I changed the scale? Child marriage is another major issue around the world because their schooling often ends when they get married. Approximately 20% of girls are married before the age of 18. And it's especially prominent in South Asia, with 45% of girls married before the age of 18, and Sub-Saharan Africa, with 38% of girls married before 18. Education can open job opportunities that may delay marriage and reduce fertility rates. 
professional women are postponing having children, which reduces their childbearing years. But it is worth mentioning that the type of work can impact family size as well. Women in rural areas where primary sector jobs like farming tend to dominate often have larger families because children can help earn money by working on the farm. But women living in cities often have smaller families as it can be more expensive to provide for bigger families in urban areas. Shifting the conversation to healthcare and family planning, increased availability of family planning and contraception leads to a decline in fertility rates. When contraception like condoms and birth control pills, among other forms, is easily accessible, women are able to avoid unintended pregnancies. It's part of what led to a global decline in total fertility rate from six to seven babies per woman to around 2.5 now. But according to the United Nations, over 200 million women want to avoid pregnancy but do not have access to contraception. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about what should or should not happen, what is right or wrong. We are just talking about the facts. When contraception is more readily accessible, fertility rates tend to be lower. Make sure on the AP exam, you're able to talk about the information pertaining to topics like contraception without injecting personal opinions into your responses. It's important to note that family planning is more than just contraception. It can include waiting longer to have a first child or waiting longer in between children. Regardless of the type of family planning, empowerment and the status of women is strongly linked to the ability to decide the number of children a woman may want to have. As we move from fertility to mortality, education still plays a role for women. The level of education and access to healthcare and family planning services also improves health and reduces mortality, especially among infants and children. Better education helps to promote good nutrition and proper hygiene, as well as encouraging regular doctor visits for both mom and baby. This has led to lower levels of maternal mortality. Again, we see a Corpus map at the national scale, but is maternal mortality ratio a good indicator of development? You're right, it is. Nearly 290,000 women still die each year from pregnancy-related causes, and 99% of those deaths occur in less developed countries. And studies have established a correlation between political power for women and mortality rates. In countries where more women serve in the national legislature and where women have stronger voting rights, there tend to be lower maternal and infant mortality. And it's important to note once again that women tend to live longer than men. And there are a number of theories as to why this is. Some have argued that women are stronger in utero, leading to greater survival rates for female fetuses. Another fact is that women develop heart disease later than do men. A study out of BYU found that people with strong social connections tend to live longer and that women have more social connections. But that study did note that married men were an exception because they had more social ties. They observed that married men live longer than single men. So I guess all these guys are single. Women take better care of their health men are 24% less likely to have visited a doctor in the last year than women. Men are 22% more likely to skip things like cholesterol tests. And 28% of men don't even have a primary care physician. 
And finally, women are less likely to be daredevils. Accidents are the third leading cause of death for men. But for women, it's the sixth leading cause of death. And they examined the psychology that explains this. The frontal lobe, which is responsible for things like responsibility and calculating risk, develops later in men than it does in women. But as you may have noticed, there are many theories as to why women live longer than men. Finally tonight, we'll discuss women and patterns of migration. Historically, men moved to cities looking for work, while women were expected to care for their in-laws and children. But recently, more women have moved from rural areas to urban areas, looking for work in factories and in other areas. A particularly good example is the migration of women within China over the last several decades. And these patterns of rural to urban migration and migration for economic opportunities are consistent with Ravenstein's Laws of Migration, a concept that we will explore in our migration lectures, but are worth noting in our discussion tonight about women and demographic trends. While they are often menial jobs with low pay and long hours, women earn more than they otherwise would in their rural village. Add to this that urban areas offer opportunities for education and training that can provide greater opportunities in the future. And that is where we will leave off tonight. Have a good evening, everyone, and I'll see you all back in class.